The FDA recently issued an emergency use authorization for the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Pfizer and BioNTech. An administration has already begun in the United Kingdom, but many questions remain. A lot of people have expressed hesitancy about the vaccine based on the accelerated timeline in which it was developed. There are issues of distribution to consider and a question about how quickly we can expect life to change with a vaccine available. And of course, there are a few myths floating around that need to be addressed. So to get to the heart of some of this, we met over Zoom with Dr. Kate O'Brien from the World Health Organization to ask these questions and more. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Our guest today is Dr. Kate O'Brien. She is the director of the WHO's Department of Immunization, Vaccines, and Biologicals. We're going to be talking today a lot about vaccines. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to this position and what you actually do in this position? I'm a pediatrician. I'm also a mother. um, And I'm an infectious disease specialist. And I've worked on vaccines for my whole career. At WHO, what I do is uh, I direct the department that um, is in charge of all the issues around vaccines and immunizations. And we work um, to assure that everyone everywhere at every age uh, gets the full benefit of vaccines for their health and for their well-being. So any of the issues around vaccines um, somehow comes through our department. A major public concern right now is safety. It generally takes years to develop a safe and effective vaccine. So how can this vaccine, developed in under one year, possibly be trusted for safety? Didn't we have to cut a bunch of corners to get here? Maybe, but not in the sense most are thinking. We asked Dr. O'Brien about this, and there are three major reasons we were able to move this quickly. We have incredibly advanced technology compared to the last time a new virus came on the scene. The resources being dedicated to this effort have been consistent and enormous. And the sense of urgency brought on by the pandemic has led to much faster transitions between testing phases. Clearly, the vaccine has been developed quickly. So can you talk a bit about what parts have been sped up and what parts have not and why we should still feel confident that it's safe? Yeah, it's really understandable that um, people in the public are thinking, well, you keep talking about how unprecedented this is, how quickly this has been developed. And and I think a lot of people sort of jump to the conclusion that must mean that there's something unsafe about the process. And I really want to emphasize how it's possible that the process has gone so quickly. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to say is that we have amazing new scientific technologies that have led to from the time that the disease was identified to actually knowing what the virus was and what the genetic code was of that virus. And that happened in a matter of weeks. Um, If you compare that to things like when HIV was first discovered, you know, um, 30 years ago, it took years from the point in time when the disease was identified to actually knowing it was a virus and what the genes were that were within the virus. So this is just about technology that has just shortened that period of time, you know, by by logs, by magnitudes. And the second thing is that... um, the things that that result in taking a long time to develop vaccines um, in part has to do with how much urgency the world or the funders of research feel there is. So most often what happens is, you know, a, a vaccine starts to be developed in a laboratory and then it takes time to get more funding to try to get testing in animals and then eventually in people. And with each result, there's then another round of trying to get the funds, the, the investment to actually go to the next stage. Because it's a pandemic, the entire world is motivated to get a vaccine. So there has been a huge influx of both time, energy, and funding to actually move all of these products along as quickly as possible. And the third way that things have gone more quickly is that um, normally in a vaccine development, we do the the phases of testing. So we do phase one, which is really about the very smallest number of people who get tested and we look for both safety and whether the vaccine does something to induce an immune response. And then we go to the second phase and the third phase. And there's often a strategic decision that's made about whether to keep pursuing this particular product or to start again and look for another product. And in this case, What has really happened is that there has been a a rapid sequencing of going from one phase to the next. What we have not compromised on is the safety data, um, nor have we compromised on what evidence is needed in order to demonstrate that a vaccine actually works to prevent disease. Have the number of people who've been included in studies been the same as with other vaccine trials, or have we done less research than usual? The number of 
people who have been involved has um, for some of the trials and especially the trials that are um, showing us the evidence on efficacy have been in the tens of thousands. Um, and so this is a, a very solid number of people who are in efficacy trials. And this is what is really the global standard. Phase three of a typical vaccine trial might recruit just hundreds to thousands of volunteers. It's also true that a typical vaccine trial might go on a bit longer, giving us data to indicate how many doses are needed or if boosters are necessary for long-term disease prevention, something that might be difficult to ascertain in ongoing clinical trials now that a vaccine's available. For example, people in the trial who are receiving the placebo now have or will have the option to get vaccinated, meaning we may end up having to monitor things in other ways than clinical trials. But what I really want to emphasize is for all of the products that have come through, we only have the short-term efficacy results. And that's logical. We've only started these trials this year. So it's only possible to know whether or not the vaccine prevents disease in the several months after vaccination. So we really need more research. We really have to continue to um, see how the vaccines perform, especially over the long term because we don't know yet whether or not additional doses are going to be needed. Are they continuing to do research to monitor all the people who've been in these trials out past, say, a couple of months to know if we will need to do boosters at six months or a year or more? Or are we just going to find out in the general public as we go? Tricky question about what to do with the people in the trials who didn't get the vaccine but got the placebo part, the part that's not actually the vaccine that we compare to. Clearly, for those people who are in these clinical trials who are part of the very, you know, the recommendations for who should get vaccinated. Um, if they didn't receive the vaccine um, in the course of the clinical trial, then they have a decision to make about whether or not they'll stay in the clinical trial um, or whether or not they'll go ahead and, and get vaccinated. So this is not a simple question, but what we will be doing for sure is um, in, a, in a number of countries around the world, we will be monitoring for its protection over the long term. And that that is best done with a clinical trial, but it's not the only way that we can do it. Do you think that this, you know, sort of harkens or is, you know, points to the fact that we've sort of entered a new age where we're going to be able to create vaccines much more easily? Or is this sort of a one-off for this coronavirus? Well, I think everybody has been pretty surprised at how efficacious these vaccines are. I think that's really taken the vaccine world, uh, you know, in a positive way by surprise. So no, I don't think that we should be expecting that every vaccine development effort is going to have the easy path. I'll point back to HIV, which has had 30 years of dedicated effort trying to get a vaccine. We're still, we don't, we're not even at the first vaccine. Some germs, some pathogens are frankly just turn out to be easier than others. They've got a target on them. The germ itself has a vulnerability. It's got something about the germ that if you can develop uh, immunity to that part of the germ, it really is going to, you know, fully protect you. So I think this was surprising, but um, there is also, um, there's no going back to the way that we used to develop vaccines. There have been partnerships, collaborations, new technology, new science that has been driven forward as a result of this um, effort to develop um, coronavirus vaccines. And I think the, the incredible benefit that has been seen from that, the speed, the design of vaccines, I, I think that's what's going to um, be durable into uh, into the, the new normal that we have. And, uh, and I think it should be harnessed. So we've got a vaccine available now, but that doesn't mean we're all getting vaccinated tomorrow. There are a lot of moving parts here. So can we, I'd like to talk a little bit about vaccine distribution. Um, I, I cannot even imagine the logistics. So how is it going to work? How, how are they going to make enough doses of this and get it where it needs to be? First of all, vaccines do need to be kept at a particular temperature. They are biological products and they do have to be maintained or else they're not, they're not active. They're not potent. In every country around the world, um, the, the, there is a supply chain and what we call a cold chain for vaccines because all vaccines um, need to be kept either at refrigerated or frozen temperatures. We can now put this new, these new vaccines into that supply chain and into that cold chain. Um, so we're doing calculations and we have tools that countries can do calculations like how many more refrigerators do they need and how many more freezers do they need? And are there special freezers that countries need? So those calculations and planning is going on right now, but it takes investment. And then the second thing that needs to happen is there have to be health workers who are actually available to deliver this vaccine. So this is an additional piece of work that was not planned for within the healthcare workforce. So again, countries are planning and, and we help them with 
um, ways in which you can redeploy people. Um, you can use um, other, other places of vaccination. In some countries, they allow vaccination at pharmacies. Um, and then there are logistics around the monitoring of the vaccines. So we need to monitor how many doses we're given and who actually got the doses. And are we succeeding in getting the vaccine to all of the people who need it? Which goes to the point of, well, who does need this vaccine? And of course, in every country around the world, the initial supply is really limited. So every country has to decide who are their top priority groups and why. So could you expand a little bit more on how we need to make sure that we don't lead into issues of equity in certain areas and resource limited settings to make sure that the vaccine and care gets where it needs to be? So often when we talk about equity, we're talking about whether vaccines are getting into all countries at the same time. And that is of absolute primary focus and primary concern. But there's also an issue of equity within countries. So we don't want to, uh, to pretend that uh, just because a vaccine comes into a country that everybody is equally likely to have access to that vaccine. And what we do know is that within countries, um, some of the people who are the, the most vulnerable, the most left out are those that are also hardest hit by the COVID pandemic. And so as vaccine gets deployed within countries, real attention within the country about who those most vulnerable communities are, the likelihood that they would be able to get services, that they would be able to access the vaccine, that really needs to be front and center. And probably the, the sort of most obvious and, and most clear example of this are humanitarian settings, refugee populations, populations who are migrants, populations who are undocumented people, they are the most hidden, the most left out, and, and really the most vulnerable. And how do countries with far fewer resources participate? Are there mechanisms to help get them the vaccine or reduced for no price? Or uh, does this involve only some countries? Or how does everybody sort of get the same seat at the table? There's a global mechanism for um, aggregating countries' um, demand and aggregating supply. And that, that global mechanism is called the COVAX facility. It stands for the COVID vaccine facility. Um, and so this is a facility where 189, we call them economies, um, but they can, that you can understand them as countries, 189 participants have joined the facility. Um, so that represents over 90% of the world's population have have acted in global solidarity and said, we know that not only is it the right thing to do to equitably and fairly distribute vaccines according to public health need, um, it's the smart thing to do. And the real target there for 2021 is to have 2 billion doses of vaccine coming through the facility. We think that's about enough vaccine to cover at least 20% of the population of every country. And that 20%, we could really get vaccine to the highest priority people, the health workers, and especially people who are in older age groups who are at highest risk of serious disease or even death. That will go a long way towards really taking care of um, you know, the, the economic and the social disruption that we're feeling. While a number of people have certainly expressed fears over taking the vaccines, a number have also pinned a lot of hopes on it. We asked Dr. O'Brien about reasonable expectations when it comes to the vaccine and returning to life as normal. So clearly we're going to be rolling this vaccine out as fast as possible, but it's not going to immediately allow us to change a lot of the way life has been uh, with, with respect to still needing to mask up and distance and protect ourselves and reduce transmission. Any predictions on when you think things might get a little bit easier and how restrictive people need to be? The first thousands of doses that are uh, delivered in a country are not going to really do anything to change the pandemic in that country. So it's certainly going to take this year for sure. Um, but I think for countries that, um, that can uh, have a really strong immunization program um, where we can get supply into the country, it's deployed to the, the highest need populations, um, I think we are going to see that um, some of the uh, interventions that uh, have been needed um, can start to be recalibrated. And it doesn't mean stopping them altogether. But um, what we've really seen is the ability to get kids back to school in a safe way, the ability to protect some of the essential services um, in a safe way. So I think, you know, over the, I don't, I, I think this time next year, we will see some changes in, in a, a, quite a number of countries, but 
it's we're going to have to watch to see what this pandemic does. We're going to have to see for those countries that are really able to get serious and solid on the implementation of all of the other tools that we already have. That's what's really going to control this pandemic. And that's what we've seen around the world. Part of the reason we did this interview was to help address both fear and misinformation about the vaccine. But these are notoriously difficult things to address. We asked Dr. O'Brien about her take on these efforts, as well as her thoughts on a few specific vaccine myths that have been floating around. So in addition to people having total misconceptions about COVID and how severe it is and how easy it is to catch and how dangerous it is, there's now misconceptions about the vaccine and how safe it is and and whether or not people should get it. So what are the best ways to talk to the general public and convince them that not only is this something that is safe, but it's something which is really necessary and that we need everybody to do? You know, I think we we know both from science and from experience that um, that people are just barraged with information. And when they go looking for information, there's just a complete mess out there of accurate and credible information that's mixed in with what might look like credible information, but is just complete malarkey. Um, So what we really encourage people to do is to use sources of information that are obviously credible. So websites that include, you know, departments of health, websites that include the World Health Organization. Look for information that comes from scientific, technical, credible sources. If something sounds really weird to you, it probably is weird. It probably isn't accurate. The other thing is that um, we are, you know, just completely dedicated and firmly believe in transparency. We will speak the truth. We will say what's really happening, whether it's good information and, you know, positive news or not such positive news. So do you mind addressing some of the specific myths or myth perceptions that people have about vaccines that they can you know, change your DNA or do something else? There's some pretty wild stories out there about, uh, about these vaccines. And of course, those stories started before we even had the vaccine. So um, I, I think that's, that's one message that uh, a lot of this is, is a lot of fear mongering. Um, but just a couple of things that I know um, some people are, are you know, questioning or wondering, is that true? Um, so we do have these new vaccines called mRNA vaccines. And I know that there's a myth that's out there that's circulating that somehow these mRNA vaccines are going to change your DNA. So let me just dispel that um, fully and once and for all. mRNA vaccines, it's what, what, what is essentially um, the vaccine is the mRNA is the recipe. It's the instructions for making a protein. And our body is not able to turn mRNA into DNA. That's a reverse course. It's DNA that results in mRNA. So there isn't any part of our body that can turn mRNA into DNA. So this is just a complete fabrication. And uh, the motivation for people to be circulating these things is really to sow uncertainty. Um, It's to create uncertainty in people. And this is really, really harmful. And lastly, we wanted to zoom out a little and look at the bigger picture. What have we learned from this pandemic that might change the way we react to a future pandemic? What should we have learned from this last year that we should definitely focus on before this might happen again? What is sure is that we will at some point have another pandemic. We've been saying infectious disease people, public health people have been warning the world for for decades that we will have a pandemic and the chances continue to increase that these will um, happen with more frequency, but we can be prepared for it. And I think what we really learned in this pandemic is even the wealthiest, most prepared, most invested countries in public health had not done what they needed to do to be ready and prepared to address and deal with the pandemic. So I think we've learned so much about this. First of all, um, uh, clear communication, early communication with um, members of the public is absolutely essential. Secondly, having clear messages about what's needed in order to deal with the pandemic. When people, again, when people understand what they need to do, um, and when it's really endorsed by leaders in the country, then um, when it makes sense, people will do it. That's notwithstanding that I think we're all in COVID fatigue. We're all tired of the restrictions. We're all tired of the changes in our lives. But the other things that we've learned is that these can, pandemics can be controlled. Um, and if we control them early um, and really have um, the, the best sharing of information and data um, that the, the world can turn it, 
turn on the public health infrastructure and turn on the scientific in infrastructure to develop the tools that we need to, uh, to address the pandemic. But that fair and equitable access to those tools is really critical because a pandemic by its nature is something that is worldwide. And if some countries have access to tools and others don't, these inequities mean that the pandemic can worsen. So Dr. Kate O'Brien, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right, so that's it for our interview with Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director of the World Health Organization's Department of Immunization, Vaccines, and Biologicals. We hope this helped answer important questions and ease some worries. If it did, we encourage you to share this as widely as you can. The best way to fight back against not only this pandemic, but misinformation in general, is to stick together and try to provide solid sources of information to as many people as we can. Hey, did you enjoy this video? You might enjoy this other video on COVID-19 and long-term recovery. We'd like it if you subscribe and like the video down below and consider going on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help make the show bigger and better even during a global pandemic. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.